So I recently realized that we were coming up on 30 years living in the same house. Nice neighborhood, the greatest neighbors in the world. When we moved in, my son was going into first grade and my daughter was going into middle school a lifetime ago. One day that first year, I was doing the New Englander thing where I was transitioning from fall to winter, changing out the screen door to a storm door off our kitchen. And back in those days, they had those metal brackets. And I had worked my way all the way around the bracket. Of course, I was late, so this, the wind is coming in. It's cold. I can't get, and I can't get the very last bracket done. It's right at the center of the bottom of the door, right behind that piston that holds the door open. And I realized I'm a problem solver that the problem was that my fingers were too big for that space, and now they were too cold. And I started thinking, how do I solve this problem? And I realized there was someone nearby who had small, warm fingers. So I called my son over. He's seven years old, and I explained the task, and I showed it to him, and I said, your dad can't get it that one. If you could just sneak your fingers in there and kind of work it, then it would loosen it, and I'd get this big glass panel in. And he looked at it, and he looked around the frame of the door. He looked down. He said, uh, why don't you open the door a little, Dad? And I realized that if you open the door, you get a whole bunch of space between the piston and... And so I said, I got it from here, but don't say anything about this to your mother. And I <laughs> got it all fixed. But what that taught me was he entered that problem with a completely new set, with a seven-year-old set of eyes and solved it in the simplest way. I was thinking about needle-nose pliers. I, I was thinking about all sorts of complex ways to solve that problem. And yet, the simplest solution in that case was the best. And over these past 30 years, I've started to think about, so how do people learn? What is it about seeing the world through different sets of eyes? We, where new eyes see everything, and how to see the world differently. And so my career has been built on how do people learn, and what's the best way for us to learn. And if we think about the, the nature of learning, that I'm one of the luckiest people in the world, because prior to my career in academia, I had a 20-year career in industry. And if we learn from mistakes, then I'm incredibly lucky because I've got a whole career of mistakes on which to build that I use now in my teaching. I also, here in academia, I ran an institute on leadership, studying leadership, working with real world-class institutions. And we did some really creative work. And I made sure during that time to also work with the real creative people, the artists, the dancers, the musicians, the actors who need learning and creativity in terms of what they do as part of their craft. And so it forces us to think about what is the nature of leadership and how do people learn. And, and through all that experience, I've come to understand that leadership is this complex thing and there are competency models and, and it's, it's in fact overwhelming. But what if I could tell you today that there's really only two things that matter? Would that be helpful to think about leadership, this broad topic, here we are talking about ad meliorum, to move to better things. If we could focus on two things, wouldn't that make a difference? And so the first of those two things, I believe, is ancient identity, being aware of ourself, being understanding what's important to us and why. This traces back at least 400 years to Shakespeare, to thine own self be true, as well as perhaps to Buddha and to all the ancient traditions, to understand yourself as the first part of decision making, to think about what's important to you when you make a decision, even if you're confused. That's, to me, the first pillar of leadership, the very most important characteristic that we need to focus on. The second pillar is perhaps the opposite of that. It's how do we be adaptable, to push ourselves into uncomfortable situations, to think about different things differently, to force ourselves out of those comfort zones. And those are the twin pillars of leadership development that we call leadership meta-competencies, overarching competencies that lead to everything else. First uh, coined by my mentor, Tim Hall from Boston University, these meta-competencies have been foundational to my career. And it's, it's the mutuality of the two capabilities, to do them both together, to do them dual, dually at the same time to exercise our identity at the same time we exercise our adaptability. If we do that, then we really tap into the true 21st century meta-competency, and that's learning how to learn. And so, how do we do that? In fact, how do I do that? And I start to think about leadership as a, as a practice. But I want to be clear here that I'm not talking about the big guy, big L leaders. 
It would be wonderful if we could, be, we could strive to be Gandhi or Mandela or a great leader. But I think for most of us, that's too abstract. What we try to teach and what I try to teach is what I call the, the little L leader, the small L leader, that leader inside ourselves. That if we can think about the way that we can be a better leader today than we were yesterday, then we're more likely to be successful. To start from that identity awareness and to push ourselves through adaptability into these discomfort zones. That, in fact, is something we can get our heads around. And so I really started feeling guilty at some point because I've already told you I've lived 30 years in one place. I've traveled around the world and done some amazing adventures and engagements, but I really wanted to push myself into a discomfort zone. So I did that. I worked with colleagues at the Center for Creative Leadership, a world-class leadership institute, and worked with them to travel and live one summer in Ethiopia. It was an amazing place. It was an amazing part of the world where I was incredibly different, incre incredibly provoked by that environment. For the first time in my life, I was the only. I was the only white person, certainly in that room, and probably for hundreds of miles. Eyeballs on me the entire time, whether I was going to market, whether I was trying to work, whatever I was doing, I was different. And it gave me a sense of place and what it might be like to be different back home. Now, I had some status as an older white man in a male-dominated society. And obviously, as a college professor, I carried some status. But I really didn't deserve that because we were working with community leaders, with NGO managers, with tribal leaders, uh, and with women and girls in empowerment. And we were working in a language that I didn't speak. Now, I knew some of the exercises and had built some of the exercises, so I knew it was happening. But what I realized was, very soon, I was a distraction. That people saw me being different, the people in the audience. And I was being a distraction from the facilitators who were running the workshop. And it started to force me to think about, what's my place here? And I realized that I needed to be small. I needed to be silent. And I needed, for once in my life, to learn to shut my mouth. And it was really hard, because this was a once-in-a-lifetime experience, to be there with the, with the greatest learners in the world and not be able to really engage the way I would like. But my place was secondary there. And so I learned that tough lesson that I think gave me a sense of humility, in addition to being a stranger, that I carried with me back in my teaching. Also, at the end of that uh, amazing reflective time, my wife came over. And we did some vacationing, and we did a, a budget safari, if you will, to the Serengeti in Tanzania. And the ten if, if you've never been, please go. This is an advertisement for, for uh, the, t the Serengeti. It's one of the most amazing places in the world. It's everything that you would think it'd be, and probably more. We went during our summer, which is their winter, so you see these beautiful yellows and browns instead of the, the verdant greens. And just to travel there and to be in that space, traveling in an open-top Range Rover, was just an amazing, life-altering uh, short trip. We stayed in these little glamping tents, um, which, were, which were planted right on the Serengeti, that had actually had uh, uh, floorboards and four posts of bed, and you'd get hot water in the morning. It was, it was pretty great, really, I, as I think about that. Um, and there's the, the lion in winter. Um, so this was, our, this was our tent. And at the night of the first campfire, we were sitting around, and we had seen, literally, dro driven up by these lions uh, and these other terrifying creatures. Um, and I said to our guide, Armani, now, I have to ask this, is it safe here? And he smiled and he said, Jack, lions are great hunters. They can find much tastier food than you. You don't, <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. Uh, and then he took his flashlight and he pitched it in the darkness. And he caught about 12 different sets of eyes of hyenas. And we were terrified and he laughed again. And he said, ah, hyenas, Terrible hunters, they eat the dead, they're, they're scavengers. He said, so don't be dead and you'll be safe. <laughs> so we went to bed, we went to bed and, and we were sleeping there and, and thinking we're gonna have a wonderful night of sleep, our first night under the stars in the Serengeti, until 3.07 a.m. when I heard the first paw hit and then the second paw, and it was heavy. It, I, in my mind, I was thinking that scene in Jurassic Park when the, when the water juggles, when the T-Rex hits. And I said to myself, it's a freaking lion. And I heard, ah, right here, scratching at the dirt outside of our tent. And I laid there frozen. 
And I go, and she was right feet away from my feet. And I didn't want to make a sound to call attention to us next to my sleeping wife thinking, what, what do I do? And then another step and another. And I lived every inch as she walked around the tent until she stopped behind me, <laughs> right here. And I could hear, and I felt the canvas move. She was putting her face right behind my head. My heart was coming out of my shirt, and I'm just laying there saying, oh, what a wonderful life I've had. Uh, it's, it's over. It's going to be over in an instant. Uh, and she paused, and then I heard a step and another step, and then she picked up her pace and trotted off into the darkness. And I let out this breath, and it was just, it was an unbelievably painful and scary moment, exhilarating. Turns out my wife was also asleep. She was laying there frozen. The two of us uh, didn't get much sleep the rest of that night. At first light, we ran out to Armani and called him over, and he was very skeptical until he saw the paw prints. And he said, yeah, that was a lion. I said, Armani, what the heck? Like you said, there was no lions that come into camp. And he could see that we were legitimately ter terrified. And he put his arm around me and said, Jack, she was just sending a message. She could have clawed through that at any moment. But she didn't. She was sending a message to me, Armani said, just to remind us all that we're here because she's allowing us to be here. This is not our place. And she's sending me a message, take these people and get them out of here soon. <laughs> and as long as we're here respectfully, that's OK. And so I thought about that message. And what I realized was, in its own way, it was the same message I got in Ethiopia to be silent, to understand my place, <clears throat> to think about the way I make my way in the world and be respectful of those who are there, whose place it is. And I think I carried that back to my own life back home. Uh, and I, as I thought about that, we, you don't have to be in Africa. You don't have to do this. That, that we go to strange places everywhere. And we move into other people's space. And we think we carry our big selves in or our little selves in. But how do we understand what our place is at that time? And how do we learn from that? I often work with CEOs. I work with undergraduate students, some great graduate students today that are working with you. And one of the things I do, we call it an admired leader exercise. We ask you to think about someone you know. Again, not a big L leader, not Gandhi, not Mandela. Someone you know in your mind's eye that you think that person is a good leader or maybe even a great leader, a small L leader. You can see them. You know who they are. And what we know is if you can start to think about the attributes, the qualities, the behaviors that that person exhibits, then, and only then, can you start to think about a plan, how to build to move towards that. Because one of the things we've learned is that leadership, in many ways, is a habit. It's a practice. It's not something you're born with. It's something you accumulate over time. As Aristotle said 2,000 years ago, we are what we repeatedly do. The second half of that well-known expression has to do with the habits that we build. That excellence is how we build these habits. At one of these workshops, one of the participants came up to me afterwards and said, I want to tell you who my admired leader was, because we often put them in coaching pairs to share their lessons so they can think about how to adapt building on their identity uh, in group settings. And she was, a, she was a senior executive herself. She was the general manager of a billion dollar division of a well-known company. And I don't know what she was uh, thinking of. I was expecting it would be some, perhaps, a CEO mentor from her own career. And she s slowly said, my admired mentor was the janitor in my building. And she said that there was a dignity with the way he went about his work. There was a quality. There was a caring. And she said, but that's not what really got me. It was how he treated me. I felt when I talked to him, I was the only person in the world. And there was a joyfulness that he connected with me, really humanly. And she said, and that's not why I picked him as an admired leader. The reason I picked him as an admired leader is because I realized he did it with everyone, with everyone in the building, not some big corporate CEO, with everyone. One day I saw him treating the homeless people outside the building the same way he treated me, with care and dignity. And she said, oh. I thought about that, and that's what I aspired to. And when I started focusing on that, she said, I moved towards that. Ad milliarum. I moved towards that. 
as a leader, and my career started to take off. And I realized that I could do that. I could be that person. I could be more empathetic. You see, leader isn't about role. It's not about power. It can be, but it's not supposed to be. Leadership is about how we create environments understanding each other, how to create a space where we both can thrive, to understand myself, to understand those around me, and create healthy spaces. And so that, I think, is the lesson of leadership. And so here we are, back full circle, as you start to think about the ways in which you go about your leadership and the way you deal with problems and confusion, maybe take the advice of a seven-year-old. Why don't you open the door a little bit? Thank you.